Warning. This program contains frank and mature discussions intended to educate and advocate on the subjects of sexuality, sex, and gender and body positivity. Due to the nature of the topics being discussed, this may include subject matter and language that some may find offensive. This program is intended for adults only. If you are under the age of 18, if such material offends you, or if it is illegal to view such material in your community, please exit now. Welcome to the Brown Chicken Brown Cow Show. Hi, everybody. This is Monkey. Guess what? We have a special, awesome show today. Not only do we have the madam joining us. Hello, madam. Hi. Oh, geez. Don't look at me that way. Good God. What, why, why did you wear this? <laughs> yeah, she just wants me to blush through the entire episode. That's nice. Um, but we also have the amazing Janet Hardy on the show today. The, uh, for those of you who may not know, the few of you out there, very few. Very few, yes. There are very few out there who may not know who Janet, Hart, Janet Hardy is. But she, along with uh, uh, one of her partners, uh, wrote The Ethical Slut. Oh, she's written a lot more. She's written a lot more. That. Well, but that's one that's one of my favorite reads. Well, yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> I have to admit, uh-huh. I don't think there's a single one of our hosts or staff that didn't absolutely squee yes. when we found out we could talk to Janet Hardy. Because we all read all of her books almost in a stalker like fashion. It's opposite. Ab- fabulous. Stalker-like fashion. <laughs> wow. Nothing to be worried about. We just enjoy our reads. Yes, very true. So we could talk forever about Janet, but really, the best thing here mm-hmm. is talking to Janet. Well, I have Janet tell us about, her, about herself, yes. And explore the uh, wonderful world in this episode about... Kink, kink sexuality, BDSM. and all of the above. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for coming on, Janet. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. So... We've given you our version of a drooling introduction, but could you tell us a little bit about yourself from your own words? Because, you know, we're a little fanning here. Oh, sure. Um, uh, Let's see. I'm I'm 62. I live in Eugene, Oregon with my spouse and my dogs and my cat and my chickens. Um, I'm I. I'm poly. I'm kinky. Um, I've been knocking around the scene for about 30 years now. Um... And I'm a writer and public speaker and editor and small publisher um, for my living. Ah. So how did you start writing about kink and sex topics? I mean, a lot of us have played in that ring, but how do you get it to writing? Well, um, I was an advertising copywriter back in the the first stage of my adult life. Hmm. I did that for like 15 years. And uh, toward the end of that, I I found the scene in the Bay Area and moved to the Bay Area and was working for an ad agency, and it did not end nicely with that ad agency. Uh-oh. It ended kind of ugly. And so I had to get money <laughs> kind of quickly. So I took an article I had been writing and converted it into a little book called The Sexually Dominant Woman a workbook for nervous beginners. And at the same time, my then partner, Jay Wiseman, was finishing up his book, SM 101. Uh, both of those books are still in, in print. Um, and between us, we managed to turn it into a little enterprise that, you know, we published books about kink. Um, and it grew from there and into what's now Greenery Press, which I sold a few years ago, but I still run the editorial side. Um, yeah. So it it just kind of happened. It was never a plan like, oh, boy, I'm going to grow up to be a kink writer. It, well, it sort of each step was logical at the time, but then uh, it all added up to being a kink writer and publisher. Yeah, It sounds like you've been writing for a long time. That That's really freaking cool. I'm also a, uh, a writer um, uh-huh. across multiple platforms. But what, what drove you to become like a, the, the sex educator and writer in that aspect? Um. It was never intentional. It was not like (laughs) something that I had planned. It was, you know, I knew I could write um, because I had been a writer of some kind in high school, Mm -hmm. actually junior high, I guess. Um, And, you know, the trick to being a nonfiction writer is always trying to figure out what you know about 
that other people want to know about that they're willing to pay you money. And in my case, that was kinky sex. Hey, monkey. So, what? you know, I, the, the, the sexually dominant woman actually started out as an article that I had written hoping to sell it to Cosmopolitan, which was not going to happen Cosmopolitan of that era. Um, but I had this article. And it just grew from there. Nice. Hey, monkey, you should start writing a book on how to be the best monkey you can be. I, I should, yeah. Um, With sound effects. I, don't I, I normally stick in the sci-fi realm and IT, so mm. to totally different worlds, right? So, Janet. <laughs> uh, yes, no. I mean, there's, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the people there, so probably there's some overlap in terms of the topics as well. Wow. I don't even want to think about a monkey with a, a single tail. That just scares me. <laughs> um, so 30 years, how has the kink or SM community or BDSM community changed over that time since you started writing and, you know, the evolution of your writing has changed? Oh, enormously. I mean, you figure I published my first book in 1992. Uh, that was before the Internet was anything but just a few people um, sending each other messages. Uh, so we had the one huge expansion when the internet grew into a thing that people could use to meet like-minded others in the mid nineties. And then another huge expansion a few years ago with 50 shades. And in both cases, everybody who was there before did a lot of bitching about, you know, all these clueless newbies that came into the scene, but the scene just sort of evolved to, to take them in um, and will continue to do so. So I have to ask, Fifty Shades, what's your thought? Um, I hear all writing, sorts of variety. The, the, the writing is just god-awful. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's badly, badly written. But in terms of raising public awareness of kink as a viable way to run your life or have your sex, it, it's not terrible. It, it teaches about how to negotiate a scene, um, the, the fact that we just don't haul out our whips flailing at each other, the fact that we actually sit down beforehand and talk about what we want and don't want. And so, you know, in that regard, if no other, it's head and shoulders above, you know, the story of O or the Beauty Trilogy or any of the other erotica that have brought people's attention to the kink scene. Um, True. And Laura yeah. wrote a really, Laura Antonu wrote an absolutely amusing spoof on it, so. Ah. <laughs> I have. Uh, it, it is entirely spoofable. Yeah, I have friends in uh, Vegas. They did a short run theater production um, about Fifty Shades, and, and ah. it, they just made fun of it up and down. It was hilarious. There, there's plenty of meat there. Oh yeah. Um, but in in any of the kink erotica, it's really easy to parody because what we do is is weird and strange, um, and makes for good parody. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's there's a an article out there or a, a parody out there about the um, the gore books by John Norman, which are another big influence that's got a lot of people. In. And it's called House Plants of Gore, and it's just brutally funny. Um, so <laughs> it's, any of those. I'm, you know, I, I don't know that anybody's ever written a parody of the Beauty Trilogy that would be really easy to do. Um, oh, I can that. imagine it already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so we talked about yeah. it making it a little more... I guess accessible by the general public and sort of demystifying some of the things we do in a poorly written but still a very informative sort of setting. How mm -hmm. do you think this has helped people feel better or maybe come into kink that might have thought it was this weird craziness that, you know, was just, ooh, that's not good? Yeah. I think the main message that needs to be gotten across is you're not extra wanting this. It, you know, it's not, quote, normal, unquote, which is a really, really ridiculous goal anyway, but it's not abnormal. It's, you know, well within the bounds of a healthy sexuality. And there are ways, you know, when, when I first came out into kink in my late 20s and early 30s, I the, the big thing for me was finding out that I was not the only person in the world got off thinking about banking. You know, as far as I was for the first decade of my adult life, I thought it was just me, hmm. um, which is hard to imagine today when it's all so out there in front of everybody. But, you know, I was being a wife and mom in Sacramento, um, and I just had no access to the kind of erotica that would have told me there were others like me. 
And so it was an epiphany to find out that there were others like me. Because then the next step was thinking, well, if there are others like me, then there might be a way to do this consensually, which would never have occurred to me either. And so, you know, that, that's a process that I would hope was there. For. By now, there, there's not too much excuse for not knowing that that's a possibility. No, absolutely. Uh, um, but... There, yeah. There's a lot of resources out there, and we've, we've talked about the internet and, and a number of books and, and a number of items that you've created and, and other people around you have created. But um, what would you recommend to new people considering entering the BDSM kink scene and world? Oh boy! Um, yeah, that's a, I know that's that's a topic in and of itself. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm working on an entirely new edition of the sexually dominant woman. Nice. That's going to be an illustrated book, um, like a comic book almost. Um, and for people interested in specifically female dominance, that's the most beginnery book I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, but then once you get past that, there are a bunch of good how-to books, including Jay Wiseman's SM101, including Through the Roses, Send Me the Thorns. Um, you know, there, uh, Ray, Ray Spannon's Learning the Ropes, which is more uh, aimed at the gay male scene, hmm. which is different in some of its um, assumptions than the hetero scene. Right. Um, there, there, there's no dearth of good books for people who want to kinky. Um, Aussie's in my, uh, the new bottoming book and the new topping book, which are more about the emotional aspects of kinky, uh, not so much about this stuff about how to tie it on. Well, exactly. And, and my, one of my partners, um, mm -hmm. is, she is uh, uh, exploring the world of kink and BDSM, and she's been doing that for a few years. And this week, um, I reread Ethical Slut. I read it years ago um, when uh, we came out as polyamorous. And this mm -hmm. week, I, I went through and I read Topping and Bottoming. And uh -huh. it really gave me new insight into the positive, the energy, the exchange, the communication, everything that, that someone would receive from these roles or from BDSM. So it really helped fill in some of the gaps that I had personally. Um, no biases, just, just mental gaps and the education of uh, what it meant. And so it was really enlightening to me to go through that, uh, go through both of those books this week. I'm, I'm really glad to hear it. That was exactly our intention. Oh, nice. To awesome. talk about the the rewards. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it can be very hard to understand why someone would want to do kink um, if you're just looking at it from the outside and it looks like, you know, someone's being hurt or someone's being made helpless or someone's being forced to take orders or whatever. And none of what shows on that is the altered state of consciousness mm -hmm. that people do. And that's really the, that's the what we're doing as opposed to the how we're doing it. Right. That's the harder part to write about it. So uh, you've been doing this for a while, and you go to talks, and you educate, and, and you go to conferences, mm -hmm. and you get people ask you questions all the time. What are some of the questions you wish they would ask you that they never seem to? Oh, man, that's, that's tough. Um, my, my greatest interest as a speaker these days is about issues around gender. So that's the one where I can just go wandering off and chat for forever. And, you know, often it doesn't even come up because people don't, uh, people, people don't question their assumption about gender as much as they should. Um, so, but beyond that, and I get asked so many things, hard to imagine what one might be that I've never been asked. So gender. Gender, I seem yeah. to recall... Mm -hmm. You have a very fluid gender. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. And your partner also has a fluid does, gender. Yeah. Yes, he does. Can you, uh, uh, you know, expand on that a little bit for us? Just for people, you know, since we've got a platform, let's talk about gender. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the difficult part about taking apart binary gender is how many structures it it takes down when you when you let go of binary gender as an assumption then what does sexual orientation mean anymore what do relationships mean anymore um you know it 
our whole culture is built around this assumption that there are two genders and that everybody is one or the other of them. Um, and when, once you let go of that, you know, it would be odd if that were true because I have trouble thinking of anywhere else in nature where binary gender is actually a thing um, or binary anything is actually a thing. Binary don't work very well in any in anything aside from like computer programming. Um, but we're really, really wedded to the binary when we talk about gender. You know, uh, I, I had an experience, I don't know, a few months ago. Part of my job, I, I do sales and I go around to different places and I was at a military base and they made me fill out an, a stupid amount of paperwork to walk on. But of one of the questions did. they asked me was what my gender was. And uh-huh. they had more options listed than I had actually ever heard of. It wasn't just male, female. It was, I don't know, a few I words. Don't, I don't remember. But they had like 15 genders 15. you could choose from. Yep. I'm, I'm surprised and impressed to hear that they would do that on a military base. That's awesome. Absolutely. It's the only place I've ever run into it. But I was very impressed by it. Uh, Facebook has, has kind of gone that direction of offering that many gender options. It's true. I actually, I think on Facebook there's like three times that many. Um, and I... I, I being an old fart, I have trouble understanding the difference between um, gender fluid and gender queer, for example. Um, I don't un- you know what, what's the difference between those two. Um, but apparently it matters to some people because they, they some people consider themselves agender and some people are gender queer and some people are gender fluid and some people are ne- neutra and so on. Um, and those are all shadings of meaning. Um, but there are all ways of saying, I don't want to be stuck in one gender. That's um, awesome. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break and hear from one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Hi, guys. This is Sean Monkey Mackinney, Monkey for short. You know what? If you're in town here in Sacramento or if you're anywhere, you need to check out Midtown Moxies. They are a Sacramento burlesque troupe that is blowing my doors off. They are amazing. Generally, they have two shows a month. One called the Midtown Moxies and one called Moxie Crush. You need to go to midtownmoxies.com or find them on Facebook. They are amazing. They're beautiful. They're funny as hell. Trust me, I wouldn't be advertising with them if I didn't believe in them. They are freaking fantastic. Enough said. Go to midtownmoxies.com. Welcome back to Brown Chicken, Brown Cow. I am Monkey. Over there, we have the Madam. Hi, Madam. Woo. And on the air right now, we have the amazing Janet Hardy with us, author extreme, Sex educator. General, amazing speaker. Um, beautiful person. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Stunning. So we wanted to just start with something really simple because we skipped over a whole lot of stuff. Oh, yeah, so much. And since we've both been, you know, avid readers recently again, um, let's start with some basic <laughs> terminology just because not all of our listeners know uh-huh. some of the words no. we might be using. So can we talk a little bit about what is polyamory? Um. That's an interesting question because the answer is not monolithic. There are different communities who define the word differently. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it's a word that's only been around for what, 25 years now. That's not really enough time for a word to settle into a permanent meaning. Um, in some cases, it might include all forms of ethical non-monogamy um, with full disclosure and uh, a commitment to deal with um, whatever emotional ramifications that brings up. Um, In other communities, it has more to do with long-term multi-partner relationships and every every shading in between. So um, I wish I could give you one good hard answer that everybody would agree with, but I can't. No, that's good. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people think that polyamory is really about the same thing as a serial monogamy. How... Thoughts on that? Um, serial monogamy might just as well be called serial poly in that most of the people I know who live that way, there tends to be considerable overlap between partner A and partner B, um, although there's a sense of moving away from partner A or partner B at any given time. There, there is often overlap. Um, but... I think poly is more to do with a commitment to find a, 
finding a place of comfort with each partner and staying flexible within that so partners may um, grow or recede in importance in your life at any given time, depending on circumstances. But there's kind of a commitment to hanging in there with any given partner um, and accommodating everybody's need for more than one partner as much as one, one can. It, it's, it's really a different mindset more than you know, from the outside, you might not be able to tell the difference between one and the next, but from the inside, it feels very really different. Okay. Um, Monkey was just mentioning he's read a couple of the books recently, actually just in the last two days, uh, mm -hmm. the bottoming and the topping book, but not everybody knows what a bottom or a top is. Could you kind of help us out with that? Sure. And again, this is a, a, a situation that shifts from one community to another. Within the gay male community where the term started, um, the top is the person who does the penetration as, and the bottom is the person who receives penetration. Um, but those got sort of adapted into BDSM uh, and have more to do with, you know, being the pitcher and being the catcher, uh, being the person who gives sensation or bondage or whatnot, being the person who receives it. Um, and that can get kind of confusing if you're talking to people, yeah, I've, I've, a gay male friend of mine told me recently that he had had his first experience topping and I had to stop and ask him, are, are you talking sex topping or are you talking CDSM talk, topping? It turned out he was talking sex topping. Mm -hmm. um, this is not my normal <laughs> usage, so I'm glad I asked. Uh, so all, all of this terminology just gets confusing. So when in doubt, you should always ask what they mean. Yep. There's n hardly any more important questions than that in the world of alt sex. Because what a person means by whatever. I mean, when I first started doing pink, I thought that BDSM meant spanking because in my head it did. And I was very startled to start dating other people for whom it meant, um, you know, doing my feet, uh, doing my pedicure or... Um, Ooh, I need one of those. Yeah, there was one guy who just wanted to put on his leathers and parade around and have me admire him. Uh, all, all of these things that sort of get lumped together under kink and they're wildly different. Okay, so let's, uh, for the case of this, let's sort of work with a working de yeah. definition of top and bottom within the kink community. So mm -hmm. top doing, top. bottom receiving, unless it's mm -hmm. in service. Um, novice tops come to you, they're all nervous, they ask for advice. What would you give them? Um... Technique matters a lot less than energy and confidence. Uh, it's easy to teach someone technique. I mean, and it, it, we like to act like it's this huge, important amount of information that requires conference after conference to pass along. It really is, you know, you can teach someone how to do the technique in a week. Easy. This is the time left over. Um, and then you can spend the rest of your life perfecting the energy and the pacing and, you know, the things that make it work or not work. Um, and I think that, that's what, I, you know, I run into people who are nervous about topping me because I am a, you know, famous expert sex educator and they don't know enough. And knowing enough has so little to do with whether I'm enjoying myself. There, there's some very basic things I don't want to have my hands fall off because the bondage's on too tight. But most of it <laughs> is one who is present and aware and transparent so I can see that they're enjoying themselves and who brings good energy to the exchange. All these intangibles that are what matter, I think, I think to most of us. Awesome. And then a slightly more experienced person who's been around topping in the scene for a number of years approaches you all nervous, you know, hey, I want, what's my next step? What's your next step? Um, are, are we talking black belt of topping? Could <laughs> no? be. Oh, wait, I, I, I used belt and topping. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> vanilla guy here. You know, go ahead. <laughs> please, the, please, Jen. The best piece of advice I ever got about topping was to stop and um, listen yourself and listen to your partner, not not in terms of their what, what they're saying verbally, although if they're saying something verbally, yes, you should listen to that. But you come to a point in a scene, everybody does, where you draw a blank. You're just sitting there looking at the toys and the person, and you don't know what to do next. 
And what you need to do when that happens is to stop and make connection with them, maybe touch some, and kind of go into yourself. And if you go into yourself, you will it, it, you'll tell yourself what, what to do next. Um, but it's easy to get rushed when you think that your partner is waiting for you to do the next thing. Um, and being rushed like that is a way to, A, make mistakes and B, not have a very good time. Yeah, because in, so, in topping, you talk about paying attention to body language and the way the person's breathing and, and, and absolutely and, all and, of that and different get in touch with the scene and the energy that's going on in a different way than most people are probably thinking about. And so that was something that was really insightful to me. So I actually have a very dear friend who um, likes to rotate. Mm -hmm. She pretty much plays in every realm that you can ever think of. And she'll play with something really hard for a little while. And then she puts it in the closet. She comes back to it a few months okay. later, or a year later, or two years later. And it's like she basically starts off as, it's, as if it's brand new. Oh. And she likes to see every time she's been doing it, even though she's been doing this for 30-something years, is every time she picks something up, she always pretends that she's learning again so she can look at it with fresh eyes and start from scratch and learn something new about the people she plays with and techniques. And so she tries to use it as a refresher to constantly just feel fresh and new about everything. That's an interesting approach that I think might work really well. Mm -hmm. it, it can be easy to get a little jaded um, by the scene um, because the, you tend to see the same types of people uh, coming up over and over again. And so it's easy to get to the point where you roll your eyes and go, oh, yeah, it's that person. Um, and coming at it fresh, I mean, yeah, I remember the first play party I ever went to, my eyes were like, Saucers, all these kinks that I had never dreamed even existed, <laughs> and I was seeing them played out in front of me. I was fresh off the tuna boat from Sa Sacramento, where we did not have such things. Wait, wait, you uh, took a boat from Sacramento to San Francisco? Yeah, well, why not? What? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, and, uh, and it would be lovely to have that freshness again. Every now and again, I meet someone whose kink is weird even to me and maybe weird even to the people who think I think is weird. And I love it when that happens because I get to have that moment of shock and freshness and having my worldview just totally turned 90 degrees. Um, and, you know, the longer I've been in the scene, the less often it happens, but I still do love it when it does. I had a refreshing moment a few years ago myself. I've been doing this for 25 plus years or so. Uh -huh. And uh, I got involved in a new relationship, an amazing duo. They are my own personal cherry orchard. They're fabulous. They are so totally new to everything <laughs> that I got uh -huh. to visit and, and learn and see everything again from like totally fresh totally. eyes. Yes. And it, it, pick cherries, not just one or two. So freshing things up is just, it's wonderful. And being able to have an entire cherry orchard of <laughs> things to pick and watching their eyes through every experience has been like the most amazing six years. Yeah, I believe it. And there's still more. Uh, there's still like more. <laughs> taking a country cousin to tour the big city that you've been living in for 20 years. Well, you never um, do the tourist stuff where you live unless you have give visitors come. I never yeah, go to exactly. Old Sacramento anymore. No, <laughs> unless there's something, you know, somebody to show it to, and then it's all shiny. I need my shiny back, so it's been fun. And Old Sacramento's still yeah. not shiny. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors, and we will be right back. Thank you, Janet. Be right back. Hi, guys. It's Sean Monkey Mackney from Brown Chicken, Brown Cow. You know what I suggest? I suggest you go to Lucky Bloke.com. Why? Because you can order your condoms online every month. Let's say you have multiple lovers that require different types of condoms, small, medium, large. You don't have to go to the store and buy all these different condoms. You can actually order them from Lucky Bloke. Let's say you have a lover that's latex sensitive. You can get latex free condoms in that same package with everything else. It is a fantastic program. It is a monthly service. You need to go to luckybloke.com and tell them Monkey sent you. <laughs> Trust me, they know who I am. Welcome back to Brown Chicken, Brown Cow. I am Monkey. And uh, I'm the madam. And we're talking about all sorts of things around uh, BDSM, kink, relationships, polyamory. This is an amazing show because we have Janet Hardy on the show. And just so you know, oh, yeah. while you can't see it on the podcast, oh, no. the monkey blushometer is already somewhere around 15 or 20 because 
Why? You know, our Patreon people get to pay Why? for, you know, the yeah. more we can make him blush, and he is just a blushing monkey today. <sighs> if you want to support us on Patreon, go out to patreon.com forward slash BCBC podcast, and you can support us on the blusher meter. And and I'm already heated in red. That's, I need a fire extinguisher for this red. It's pretty uh, awesome. All right. Anyhow, Janet, we wanted <laughs> to, uh, we'd looked to, uh, yeah. okay, so like I told you earlier, we may have possibly been trolling your pages and trolling. your books. And Stalking. you have a huge <laughs> number of workshops. And, you know, just in case anybody's listening and they need their interest in bringing you in, let's talk about a few of them. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you can give us a little teaser on each one of them if people might be interested. I know it'll make me happy. Uh, you have one called Ethical Sluthood, <laughs> The Foundations of Non-Traditional Lifestyles. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Uh, that's one where I, uh, I assume that the audience has not had too much experience with uh, poly or any kind of ethical non-monogamy. And I walk through the basic principles um, just in kind of sketch form and then open it up to questions so that people have a chance to talk about or ask about some of the issues that are confronting them in trying to make this move in their lives. And it, to me, what's most important about that is to get some audience participation in the answers because, you know, I've been doing this a long time, but I'm not an expert by any means because nobody. Um, and I think yeah, at any given time, any group is going to have uh, a group wisdom that is more than I can do on my own. Exactly. So it's almost, it becomes almost like a brainstorming session. Oh, nice. It sounds like the next one I'm looking at here might be a little bit more advanced, the Sluthood Practicum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that that one is much much more of the Q and A. In fact, it's pretty much all the Q and A format. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't spend a lot of time at the front of the room yakking. Instead, we just uh, I bring index cards so that pe people can ask their questions anonymously, no. and we just spend a couple of hours um, brainstorming answers for them. Nice. Awesome. One of my personal favorite ones: girl fags and guy dykes. What do they mean? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, a girl fag is a woman like me who is um, probably a, a cis woman, but who has always felt most at home among gay men and prefers to have gay men as partners and lovers, is drawn to gay male sexuality. Um, a guy dyke is the other side of the coin, a guy who is kind of a lesbian inside and uh, drawn to lesbians and feels most comfortable around them. Um, my, my spouse Edward is a guy dyke, a full fag, and it all kind of works out okay somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I use the workshop to talk about some of the niches in orientation and sexuality that, and gender for that matter, that kind of fall through the cracks in talking about uh, you know, as, as though hetero, homo, and bi were the only ways of having an orientation. They're not. There's all kinds of ways of having an orientation that don't. I've always often, considered myself a gay man in a trapped in a dyke's body. So. Yep. Yep. A lot of us do. <laughs> and one of my partners is pretty yep, much a dyke trapped in a yeah, in, in a straight man's body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. My my spouse is. Uh, I'm like the the least butch woman he's ever been with. Um, um, if you've seen my picture, you know that's not very, uh, I, I'm pretty butch, uh, and the rest of them make me look sort of timid. So that, that's just the way he, he, he's drawn to that. And also, he, he tends to be interested in very feminine boys and very masculine girls, uh, and that's the way his sexuality rolls. What can, what can you tell me about uh, small publishing and self-publishing for alternative uh, cultures? Oh, golly, that's a, that's a longer workshop oh, where I just sort of lay out what I have learned. Some of it is the same stuff you would get in any basic how to be a small publisher workshop, but there's a lot in those workshops that they don't understand marketing to a niche market, which some, uh, a press like Greenery does. Mm -hmm. And pricing is different. Um, a lot of things are different if you have a small niche market of people who talk to each other a lot. There's things you can get away with that you wouldn't be able to get away with if you were publishing um, gardening books. <laughs> gardening, kink. 
Yeah. Hey, I've had some great success in kink with gardening tools. I'm just going to put it out there. Oh, you and your pervertibles. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> cool. Yeah. There's nothing that can't be perverted. Nothing. Wow. <laughs> So it's next true, topic actually true. sort of even ties into our next month. Next month, we're, our That's general right. topic is on general spirituality and, and sexuality. And I see that you're yes. doing a BDSM spirituality for the left brain. Right. Um, or left, as the case may be. Yeah, I, I talk, I, I think the whole of kink is to achieve an altered state of consciousness, um, at least not, maybe not all kink, because that's a pretty broad generalization, but much kink. I think that's why we do what we do. And that can be really difficult to understand if you're someone who is put off by the terminology of the various spiritual practices. Um, if you hear the word Kundalini and you just shut down, because I was that person once too, and I kind of am. So I'm, I like to try to frame my experiences and other people's experiences way that works even if you're kind of an engineer left brain type none of us are that what? none of us none what? of us are engineers in this room no none no. okay oh, all of us are yeah we're all <laughs> geeks in this room i swear um now um how about uh, beyond the boundaries of sex what, what do you want to share about that oh i want to what that one's about is trying to open people's minds to all the th different things we do that are not what straight world would think of as sex that are eros that are part of our oh, there's not even a category for it is how far away we are from it right um it's yeah uh I, the first time i met a loony which was many years ago someone whose kink is uh balloon <laughs> okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay, I'm Canadian. Yeah. I went with the dollar I went the on that dollar, one. I was yeah. very confused. I went with the two, uh, two dollar there. Oh, Toonie is the two dollar, sorry. Sorry, anyhow. Yeah, I, I was fascinated because that's fascinating. And I asked him what it was about balloons. And the, he, he explained for a while. But the phrase I remember is he was talking about something he really liked was to have his mistress throw up a balloon to the point where it pops. And... Apparently, the kink for him was having his mistress's breath captured in the balloon. But then he said, and it pops, and it's like my heart explodes with it. And it was just so lovely trying to hear him talk about something. Because he, he clearly felt it very deeply. I had um, never thought about it that way. Yeah, and I hadn't either. And it just really, you know, I, I had that lovely heart-opening feeling toward him as he was saying it because he was so passionate. It was sweet. It gives me um, thoughts. And I, I think you would find very few definitions that include watching someone blow up a balloon. But for him, that was sex. And so we have to think about, um, particularly in these times when having what most people think of as sex and genital contact um, can be riskier than a lot of us want to do, um, it behooves us to think about some other ways that we can awaken our personal arrows um, by having some other kind of sex. So those are some amazing, and I know they're not all of the workshops, but they're just a, a select few. If somebody was interested in you coming by and doing a workshop for them, how would they get a hold of you for that? Um, my website is at uh, JanetWHardy.com. They can, there's a contact place there. They can drop me a note and I will let them know what my financial needs are for a thing like that, and we can put something together. Nice. Awesome. And I know you've written a ton of books and co-authored a ton of books, and I have to ask just because I'm this way. Uh oh Which one's your favorite? <laughs> oh, what's girl your favorite fag. child? Oh, Girl Fag. All right. Oh, yeah. Girl, yeah. Girl, girl Fag is the closest to my heart, with Radical Ecstasy very close behind. Awesome. Um, Anything uh, new coming down the pipeline? Um, I'm doing the new the new sexually dominant woman, the, the graphic novel y one. And behind that there is the possibility of another memoir that I'm talking about doing in creation with my two sons oh. who are both grown now and both writers and artists. Oh that's their be own. Fun. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, your um, point of view, yeah. A lot of us uh, have yeah. kids in our lives, okay. whether they're ours or godchildren or nieces or nephews and navigating those conversations of why are you doing that uh-huh 
Yeah, all of all, we, we haven't quite figured out what the book is about, you know, what our angle on it is going to be. But we're all into doing it, so we just need to spend more time brainstorming on it, I think. Awesome. Find a way to tell the story from all three of our points of view, because their, their version of the narrative is very different from mine, as, as should be. Um, but basically, you know, uh, years and years ago, someone on Usenet um, who was trying to piss me off wrote this thing in which they referred to me as a leather mom. And so far as, you know, so far away from pissing me off, I was enchanted by the word leather mom and immediately opened a file on my desktop called Leather Mom, waiting for me to write a book to go into the file. Awesome. So I don't know if this, if this is going to be that book. We've also talked about Slut and Son. I think a terrific title. I like that one better than Leather Mom. Leather Mom's awesome. Yeah. It's Slut and Sons. Almost sounds <laughs> yeah, like it should I, be a business. <laughs> I, think, I think Slut and Sons is, is pretty cool. So anyway, if we do it, it's still quite a few years off, but that, that's the, the next thing. And I, I have another memoir that the writing is done, but I'm beginning to ponder the possibility of doing it as illustrated as well. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. So we'll see. I, as you can probably tell from me talking about it, I've been putting a great deal of my time and energy into getting my art skills back up to speed after quite a few years of not doing that. Are you are you actually illustrating these in addition yes. to writing? Yes. Wow. Yep. That's even more amazing. Yeah, now, now it has to be all sort of purchased and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Jan Janet, do you have any events coming up that, or, or appearances? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Nothing right now. Um, okay. We're kind of kind of into the winter lull at this point. I was very busy over the summer, and there hasn't been much. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a lot of podcasts because the new edition of The Ethical Slut just came out. A exactly. Few weeks ago. Yes. So, so just so, uh, one last of series it. of questions. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Resources. If people are looking for, if they're maybe they get a, they say something they shouldn't, they have some concerns about mental health, legal, financial. Um, I know the Woodhall Foundation is pretty good. Are there any sorts of other resources like that that you could point people to? The Woodhall Foundation is great. National Coalition for Sexual Freedom is great. Um, are we talking kink or poly here or both? Both. Yeah. Anything that people, because there's so much crossover between those communities. Um, in terms of poly, um, there's a website called Poly in the News. It's a blog, I think. Um, and my colleague, Franklin Vo, who wrote More Than Two, has an excellent website about poly resources at morethan2.com. Um, in terms of kink, um, well, you know, I'm not, pretty much any city of any size has one or more kink organizations in it. Most of them have web pages with a lot of links and resources. Um, the one that I worked with for a long time is the Society of Janus uh, in San Francisco. They have an excellent website, a newsletter. They have both a, uh, an online and a print newsletter. Um, and all of those have an, a lot of links to other resources. So rather than put you there myself, because it's been a while since I've done that homework, I would suggest going to the SOJ site or the TESS site in um, New York or Black Rose in D.C., um, and then there's altogether different sites if you're primarily, primarily lesbian or gay. Um, the, the communities have different protocols and different um, assumptions. Fantastic. So, yeah. There's a lot out there, I know. I was just wondering if you had some favorites. Well, thank you so much for being on here today, Janet. We are, appreciate it so much. And oh, great pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been been a joy to talk to you. Um, we are really uh, are just ecstatic and happy to have you on the show. Um, that's not really all I got. I mean, I, I'm now just blissed out with uh, uh, being able to listen to you and, and share with you and and He's explore. Queen. I, I know. I'm, I'm fan. Oh, thank you. I'm all fanboyed. This is the <laughs> brown chicken brown fanboy. Is good. I like fanboys. Um, all right. <laughs> I will talk to you guys another time then. Thank you. Thank this you. This is the Brown Chicken Brown okay. Cow Show, and we're out. For information on becoming a sponsor, advertising with us, or becoming a guest on our show, visit us at brownchickenbrowncowshow.com. All material in the show is copyrighted 
2017 by the Brown Chicken, Brown Cow Show and Podcast and Marry You Creative Solutions. All rights are reserved. Brown Chicken, Brown Cow. 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 Brown Chicken, Brown Cow.